Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another part of our Neutrino Day event. Um, today, I'm really excited to welcome Jeremy Red Eagle, a member of the Sisseton Wapaton Oyate on the Lake Traverse Reservation. Uh, Jeremy is the program director for the Dakota Language Institute, and as such, spends his time learning, teaching, and documenting the, the Dakota language. And has, he's worked with Native American youth from Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Minnesota for more than a decade. One of the many effective methods Jeremy uses to reach youth is to teach them traditional Native games and other cultural activities where he incorporates the traditional values and history of the games. Now, as this interview takes place, please feel free to submit questions via the chat function on YouTube, Vimeo, or Facebook, wherever you're watching, and uh, we'll try to answer them along the way. So right now, I want to welcome Jeremy. Hello, Jeremy. Thank you for joining us today. We're really excited. Hello. Thank you for having me. So um, I want to start by just asking you if, if you could talk a little bit about your background, uh, your and how you ended up getting involved in doing this, um, working with Native youth and so on. Okay, so um, you said I'm enrolled here in Tin. Uh, I've lived here for about the last six years, but I originally was raised in Montana. I uh, also descend from the uh, Cinnaboyan people of Fort Belknap on my uh, grandmother's side. And so growing up in Montana, I guess I had a similar upbringing to, you know, a lot of uh, our youth, especially our, our native youth, you know, as far as um, a lot of the things that affect our communities, you know, uh, being statistics, you know, high school dropout, um, drugs and alcohol, and a lot of uh, other things that I was exposed to in my life that kind of... Um, got in the way of me being able to to really do uh, good to change my life I wanted to give back by helping young native youth to not have to maybe go through some of those things and so I worked for an Indian center out of uh, Helena Montana and I started a youth program there and it was all based on prevention uh, we have, you know, we had a diabetes clinic, we had a drug and alcohol counseling, we had all these services that we offered the community. Mm -hmm. And so I talked with my boss, I said, what do we have to prevent these things to prevent our young people needing these services when they get older. And so that's how we came about to start the youth program. And it just by chance, one of the first things that I um, learned about about or was uh, had the privilege of being a part of was our Indian Center actually hosted this uh, traditional games workshop put on by the International Traditional Game Society that's based out of uh, it originated in, in um, Browning, Montana up in Blackfeet country and then from that they've grown to include games from all over the, the world really um, but mainly the northern plains is where most of the, the teachings that they have come from. So when I uh, became a part of that, I was really taken back by it. I've always been involved in my culture. I've always, you know, wanted to learn more about it. And so this was a way of connecting to young people. You know, you're, you're, you're doing games, you're having fun, you're uh, being active, but then there's things that are, um, have a lot of deeper teachings and cultural things connected to that. And so that's where it started. And... Um, from then, it just grew to where it's become a part of what I do. Okay. Now, um, one of the things you and I had talked about earlier is the games um, and activities. It's more than just, uh, oh, let's go out and kick a ball around or throw a ball around or play some dice. You, you, you Throughout the, the history of the Dakota people and other Native peoples, Games have played an important role in helping shape people. Is that, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. So when we go back to 
our creation stories. Um, I'm really big in, you know, right now I'm really focused on Dakota people specifically, but I've done a lot of research just in general throughout North and South America and how indigenous people from both continents really, um, how, how games are a big part of our way of life. Mm -hmm. So we go back to our creation stories and all tribes have something in their creation story that talk about these things. So you have the Haudenosaunee people or the Iroquois Confederacy that have the um, lacrosse, you know, and they have stories that go back to their creation that talk about that and that the creator gave them that game to play for his entertainment. So when they go out there, they believe that they, you know, they give it everything that they have. It, it's not even a matter of winning or losing. It's a matter of playing to the best of their ability. And you go down south to the um, Chickasaw, Choctaw and them, and they have their stick ball. They have stories connected to that. We as Dakota and Lakota people, we have stories connected to these. Um, one story from out west there in the Black Hills is the great race, you know. So whether they're ball games, they're running, whatever they are, they're competition. And so these things are, yeah, they're, they're embedded in our, in our creation stories. And so as time goes on, you know, we, we utilize these things to develop skill. Um, and not just skill as in like physical, you know, of course you're going to, you know, as a runner or hand-eye coordination through a lot of these games, but also respect, teamwork, values, your place in the community, all of these things, uh, these games help to strengthen that or help to identify those things in an individual. Okay, great. Um, so uh, one of the things that I was hoping um, you might be able to talk to us about is um, uh, today, in today's world, it's a little bit different. You know, we learn a lot of different skills in a lot of different ways. Um, so how how does uh, how do these activities and games help youth now? You you talked about trying to help youth who are troubled, and or who to prevent that from ever happening. So what are the what are the steps you take, and and what all goes into uh, these activities as you teach them today? Well, I think uh, the one that I have the most success with, and the, that I can talk the most about experience with is lacrosse so it was about five years ago that um at my my children have been involved with this stuff for a long time they've always played the different games and my older boy was really into lacrosse he was playing both the modern lacrosse that you see but also learning about our traditional dakota lacrosse and so we were living in you know our, our housing community and enemy swim at the time and naturally kids just started to kind of notice that my son you know had this lacrosse stick and was doing things and you know so they would start to come over and then you know we we kind of had a dream to start a lacrosse team but it was un, unheard of here there was no youth that that were aware of most of them never even heard of the game so we just slowly started to introduce it and i think one thing that it does for sure is that it's uh, identity you know, a lot of our young people or a lot of native people in general, you know, we've, we, we struggle with a lot of things when it comes to our identity, when it comes to the way that outside society looks at us or the stereotypes, different things. And so when you can introduce something that connects them to who they are, to their culture, you can teach them the history of those things. And then they can also take that thing and put it into a modern way of living. You know, we know that in Indian country, basketball is a is a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, but with lacrosse, it's actually got a lot of roots. You know, there's there's something there. And, you know, we can look at these, the, the Treaty of 1851, uh, Traverse de Sioux in Minnesota, where they had paintings of these lacrosse players, you know, dressed in all of their, you know, regalia and uh, whatnot. And they would, you know, give the descriptions of how they would, you know, play this game. And so I think for a lot of our young people that there's something to that that really um, that they gravitate towards. And then on top of that is that in the traditional game of lacrosse, we don't have a lot of rules. And so sometimes in modern sports, I see that we have like young people that may, maybe they're not athletic. Maybe they're not 
uh, don't feel like they're up to the standards of what an athlete is. And so I personally experienced this with a few young people that they would show up and they would just be watching from afar, you know. Um, and then next thing you know, I find a way to include them. And one of the stories from the Haudenosaunee, they actually talk about the, the birds and the animals and them playing against each other and how one of them, the, the bat was not wanted by either one because they said he wasn't a bird and he wasn't a, an animal. But then after they settled that here, the bat ended up winning the game for them. And so that's a lesson of that we all have strengths. We all have something to contribute. And so, you know, I really try to um, implement that into our team and, you know, with doing these things that everybody has something to contribute to it. And one of the things that um, Phil Jackson, you know, the winningest coach in NBA history, he would use the triangle offense. That was what's, what he's known for. And what the tri triangle offense is, is all about natural cooperation between the players. So I believe as a coach that I'm wanting my uh, players to learn how to trust each other, how to work with each other instead of me telling them all these plays and all these things that they need to go out and do i want them to have a natural cooperation between one another because that's how we lived as a society long ago and so trying to to bring that back and to reinstill that into them okay now how does your how does the dakota language fit into all of this because that's one of the things that you also talked about with me a little bit earlier yeah so our language, uh, to me, it, it ties into everything. It, it's we have to bring it back to being an everyday part of our life. And so when I would uh, coach our, my kids, I would use the language, whether we're warming up and we're just counting and doing simple things in the language, you know, using the language as we're doing that. But even our positions and the, um, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, giving them different commands of things to do on the field. We, we would do that all in the language, you know, and, and then the other benefit of that is that the other opponents won't know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so like code. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and so, but, but really, um, really trying to get them, you know, we, as Dakota people, the cross went away for a long time mm -hmm. because of the whole, the war of 1862, everything that happened, it really affected us. And, so lacrosse hadn't been in our community for a long time, but there's other tribes that still held on to that. You know, the Haudenosaunee out in New York, uh, the, the, the stickball players down south, a lot of these different communities, they still have it. And so to be able to watch that or to research those things or to show them that they still take a lot of pride in those things. You know, and so really working hard to to reinstill that into them. And so it's it's a it's a whole identity. And so all of that, you can't separate those things. The culture, okay. the teachings, the language, all of that are all connected. And it all helps uh, young young people uh, with their identity and strengthen their their view of themselves and their role within the community, correct? Yes, because if you if you don't know your role or your responsibility, you, you're going to you're going to feel lost. And with that can come fear and anger and all of these other things. And I, I believe that that's what a lot of our young people are facing today. And so when you have that identity, you have that you get self-esteem with that. And when you have self-esteem, you have confidence. When you have confidence, you're not afraid to go places and to do things. And, you know, so that's one of the good things about the lacrosse is that today we have um, modern game of lacrosse, you know, which there are some things with that, that, you know, I'm, I'm for, and I'm not, I'm not for, you know, the, the stuff that we deal with. But the good thing is that they can get scholarships. It's young. It's easy for young people that want to play lacrosse to get scholarships to go to college. So for our young native youth, that's, that's a huge thing for them. And when we're seeing it, um, we, we know a young man that got recruited to, you know, uh, one of the big, you know, Ivy League schools to, to go play lacrosse, you know, so it's those, those possibilities are out there. Excellent. Excellent. Now, one of the things you told me about, you mentioned that in lacrosse, uh, uh, 
Native, Native American type lacrosse games, there are not a lot of rules. One of the other things you brought up to me is that with lacrosse, it, it can be something that ranges over a few hundred feet or several miles. How, yeah. how did that work? How, did, how do you have a game with people spread out over a large land mass? So for one, our people, they used to be able to, to run great distances. You know, it's not unheard of for um, a lot of uh, Native peoples to be able to run anywhere from 30 to 100 miles in a day. You know, those, that was how they got around. And for young Dakota men, it was expected that they'd be able to run all day and all night without getting tired. So playing a lacrosse game on a field that's anywhere from 300 yards to a half a mile, you know, it was a common thing. And they, they say that, you know, probably no f ball game out there was played on a field any smaller than 300 yards. So, uh, but, but it's, for one, you, everything was done off the land. You know, they didn't have actual fields. Some, some tribes might have, you know, had fields that were, you know, established, I guess. But for the most part, you're finding, you know, areas where you can play. Um, so that, you know, those are going to uh, probably, uh, you know, determine how, how the size of your playing field. And then also, you know, we have different types of games that were played. A lot of them had ceremonial uh, reasoning behind them. Some of them, it was, you know, just amongst the, the community, you know, the village itself of uh, playing. But then there were these large games where they would play, you know, tribes would play against each other or different bands or family groups would play against others. And so you could end up with as many as 50 to 100 on a team. So they would be spread out, you know, on these large, these large fields. And yeah, there were very few rules. There were some rules, but there was very few of them. And the, one of the biggest rules was the, the respect and the self-control that an individual player had over themselves. And so be getting angry, um, purposely fouling people, things like that. And when I say that, I mean, like, there was a, definitely a physical sport where people would get hurt, but you couldn't, you couldn't react out of anger, whether you're on the defense or the offense. That, and that's pretty much uh, among most tribes that I have found that, that those kind of uh, expectations existed. And so uh, for young men, you're teaching them how to remain in control of their emotions. Because they okay. say that these game, okay, like okay. lacrosse or any of these games, they, they really, they represent life. And so that life is like, like a game, you know, and um, you, you have to know how to conduct yourself, you know, how to know how to get around and to, to score points and to do those things. And so by the, the way to do that is to remain in control of your emotions and to think decisively, you know, to act, you know, with a, with a clear mind. Okay, and, and that's kind of an honorable thing too, isn't it? To, to, yes. to behave that way during a game. Yes. So, so this week, um, Jeremy, um, you, you put together, uh, and you said your sister helped you with this, put together some videos of different activities. Um, what are some of the things that uh, our viewers, our Neutrino Day participants can do at, 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 with these activities? And then um, can you tell us a little bit about what your expectations are for them to take away from learning some of this? Yeah. So one of the games that we did was um, the dice game, Kutepi. And uh, real quick, you know, a little history thing on that, since I'm into the language, is that Kansu, if you ask any fluent speaker today, the word Kansu means a, a card. You know, like an ID card or a movie ticket or something like that. And what it really comes from is Kanta is the wild plum and Su is a seed. So Kanta Su, they, then they shorten it to just Kansu and, and it's a plum seed. So a long time ago when our people were put on reservations, it was a lot of our uh, cultural activities were outlawed, not just ceremonial, but even our our social things, they were, they were outlawed and they could no longer practice those things. So the women were the ones that mainly played this game. Men did play it, but it was mostly women. So anyways, this game was outlawed. They were no longer allowed to play it, but they were given 
between playing cards that they could play, you know, like, you know, how uh, non-native people use playing cards. So when they were playing this game, it resembled the dice game. So they called that Kansu also. Oh, okay. And then when they were given ration tickets, okay. those ration tickets were shaped like the playing cards. And so that became Kansu. And so then today, uh, that's how the, the word evolved to where it's talking about a card. Okay. So just a little interesting history with that. But that okay. this game is, you know, the, the plum seeds that have the different symbols engraved on them. And there's a, different stories connected to, to this game. And this game, you'll find variations of it throughout all of the, the different bands of the Ocheti Shakoni or the, you know, Dakota people. And so the one specific that we did um, was with the, the elk the turtle and the lizard i believe was the one that we had shared on the video and so it's just like any other dice game uh, one thing i want to make clear and i think we explained that in the video was that these when it comes to a lot of the rules um like when it comes to points and you know what what things are worth and all of that stuff those are really up to the players to determine those things and to come up with that a lot of things in our way of life aren't standardized meaning that okay. Uh, you know, you, you have an agreement between the players on that. And so problem solving, you know, you have young kids that are going to sit down and play this game. They have to work together to figure those things out and to come up with that. It doesn't come with a rule book. Oh, okay. There's, you know, some basic, you know, rules, basic ways of playing it. But for the most part, it's really a consensus between everybody involved. Oh. And so that was the one of the games. And that's one that, that people can make themselves, whether they actually go out and harvest the, the wild plum seeds, because those grow all over South Dakota, both on the west side and the east side. But also you can use small, like you would take deer antler and cut those, like how they make the buttons out of them. And then you can engrave on them or use a marker to, to come up with your symbols and that your scoring sticks can just be made from willow or choke cherry or oh, any kind of branches. Yeah. And so that, that's a game that people could easily make on their own and, and play. Uh, the other videos, um, most of them were the ball game ones and the lacrosse, the shinny, the double ball, the hoop and arrow. Um, so those those games are pretty self-explanatory as far as like how your typical team field games go. But like we said, the the big difference is that we don't have a ton of rules. Um, when we're working with younger people, we it's always about respect. Depending on who's playing and where at, it, it you know really determines on kind of how physical the game gets. When okay. when growing men come together and play lacrosse in a traditional way, it can get very physical. One rule that we have is if we combine like have both uh, male and female out on the team or adults and youth is that the, the the rules start to change in that the the men as as men in our society we're providers and protectors and so we have a responsibility with that so that's one thing i teach young men is that a female if she wants to get physical with you she can and there's nothing you can do about it if she wants to yank your stick out of your hand there's nothing you can do about it but to accept that. But you, in turn, cannot get physical with the females or with anybody younger than you, smaller than you. And so, it's again, it's teaching them about that self-control, and it's teaching them about their role in our society and what their responsibility is. Great. So, uh, Hey, Jeremy, I've got a couple of questions here from the audience. This okay. is an interesting one. It says, uh, how can people from outside your community be allies to the indigenous tribes and nations? Wow. I know, we weren't <laughs> expecting a, that one, were we? <laughs> that's a good question. And with a lot of the things that we're experiencing today that's going on in the world, that's, that's a really good question. And I think number one is that, that allowing indigenous people to have a voice. I think that's huge. That's first and foremost is allowing us to tell our own stories. And just like what you guys are doing right now, you're allowing me to come to come on and have a voice to, to share these things. So no matter what the venue it's at, I think that that's number one is, is allowing Native people to have their voice and to speak, speak the truths of, 
you know, our experiences in this world and, and whether it's historically or present day, what those truths are and to be able to allow us to, to say those things. That, that's, be, that's probably my biggest thing that I would answer to that. Great. That's a great, that's a great answer. I would add and, and be respectful when, you know, show yes. respect by accepting that not everybody thinks exactly the same and we have to be respectful of other cultures and their belief systems. Yes. Yes. Without a doubt. And here's another one. Um, in what ways is your community preserving your history and culture? And I think we've been talking about that a little bit. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's a difficult thing because a lot of our people, you know, some of them are very passionate about our language and culture and history. Some are not, and some are in between, you know, because we do live in a different world. We live, you know, where we're a, a trying to hold on to our identity but yet we still have to manage and function in the society that, you know, that surrounds us. And so it's a challenge. But our biggest thing here, we're fortunate. We have two uh, tribal schools that our, you know, children can choose to go to or they can go to public school. But at our tribal schools, they get a lot more um, culture, history and language taught to them. And so there are a lot of efforts being done to hold on to that, to that identity. And so also, you know, with the, with the move from, you know, uh, your cultural ways of living for centuries, uh, you know, just uh, very different from what it is today. But as, as Native peoples were moved on to reservations, a lot of that was lost. And so what are, uh, I'm just going to add another question to that. What are, uh, I think part of what you're doing is to kind of recover some of that lost stuff, but how do you how do you do that? How do you go about recovering the, the, the games that were lost or the traditional um, ceremonial events or other things that were not allowed to be practiced for so many years? How, how, how is your community helping to recover those lost things? First and foremost is, is our elders. You know, I, that's what I do is I spend most of my my time with our elders. I, you know, they're always number one. They're always the, the, you know, the, the ones that give approval for things. Um, but of course we run into situations where they themselves may not know of certain things because it's been so long since we've had some of this stuff. Um, so then I, you know, like I said, that's number one. And then I, from there I go to research, you know, uh, um, one thing I've been doing a lot lately is um, museums going into the, you know, maybe the, the collections that out aren't, aren't out on display. Um, then also like written sources, on, which you have to be very, very careful with because there's a lot of things put in books that are not true or they're only partially true when it comes to our culture. But there's also a lot of written documents out there from our own people. You know, George Bush Otter was a Lakota who, who documented a lot of stuff, a lot of stories and things in the language even. And so I, I have access to those copies and I go through and transcribe them to my the best of my ability. I'm not a fluent speaker, but I do my best so that I have an understanding of what he's talking about in those narratives. Um, uh, Charles Eastman, Ella Deloria, these are other Dakota individuals that, that wrote about our history and culture. So sometimes those things are valuable because they can piece in little things that might be missing. Um, and then also, of course, the, the surrounding communities. You know, I start here in my community, but then I can go to other communities where maybe some elders there uh, uh, retain knowledge about specific things that maybe don't exist here or in other communities. Sure. So it's sure. definitely it's definitely challenging, but it's you know it, it's a you have to be dedicated to it. You have to put in a lot of work yeah. into. And I also believe on a spiritual level that our ancestors want us to know those things, and they're going to provide a way for us to have access or to learn about those things if we're doing it the right way. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, now, one of the things that I wanted to uh, touch on is. Um, I, we we started this, but we didn't get to finish it. What do you want? What do you want um, our viewers to to walk away with? What do you want them to learn from this? So, if there's any if there's any native youth or any native people watching, you know, I want them to be able to at least be aware of this now about our our native games and to 
start to go and research and ask questions about these things and find a way to implement it into their home, their community, their schools. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. All the museums, the Journey Museum in Rapid City has a lot of stuff on games. Um, Rosebud, uh, St. Francis, they have a huge collection in their museum down there. Uh, Mike Marshall is another individual, a friend of mine from Rosebud, who does a lot on games. So you know, he's somebody that people could reach out to. Um, but for the, the non-native uh, viewers is just really starting to question and, and learn and understand where things come from. Um, when you look at most sports and games today, you know, in the United States, they definitely either directly come from native people or they were influenced by native people. So pretty much all these field games that you see, they were influenced by what native people did on this continent. Because when the Europeans came here, they were taken back by these large ball games that they never really witnessed, you know, in their country of, of origin. Um, so really looking at what contributions native people have made to, to this country is, is a big thing. Um, but then also the idea that these games, you know, the, the, the lack of rules is really about the spirit to that game and having fun and, and community. And I think now, you know, we're experiencing this with our, our, the, the COVID-19 and, you know, the self quarantine, all these things that have been going on, you know, there's a lot of time for self-reflection, a lot of things of myself, you know, I'm really involved with my family and my children, but it was like on another level now because you are not traveling nowhere, you're not going anywhere, you're around your kids 24 hours a day. What, what can we do to strengthen those family bonds, you know? Or maybe you have other uh, relatives that, you know, you, you might go around during this time. How can we take advantage of this time and start to strengthen those relationships? And these games are a perfect opportunity to, to learn them, to share them, to make them, all of those things. Great. Jeremy, is there anything, um, I'm, I'm waiting to see if we have any additional uh, questions from our audience, but is there anything that you'd like to add that maybe we haven't touched on today that we should have, or that might just be good for people to know, fun for them to know? Not really. I, the biggest thing is, like I said, there's a lot of resources out there. All the museums in South Dakota have some kind of a uh, little thing on, on native games, uh, St. Joseph uh, Museum, the Octa Lakota Museum, you know, Pier, uh, the, the historical society there, they all have these things. And so, you know, research it, look, yep. look it up um, and, you know, have fun with it, you know, you know, try it, try some of them out, you know, there's, sure. you know, a lot of these things, you know, we're not afraid to share, you know, there's, there's some that might be more culturally sensitive, but a lot of these, they're, they're games, you know, so uh, have fun with them. Crazy Horse Mountains, another place, I know they have a little uh, exhibition thing in the back there where they have some, some native games there. Okay, I have two more questions, Jeremy, one is for you and, and one is directed at me. So here we go. What is your favorite game to play? My, my favorite, I would have to say lacrosse, lacrosse without a doubt. Um, even though I'm getting older now and I get, if I play one game, I, it takes me days to recover from it. But <laughs> the most exciting thing I ever did was my, my son was about 16 years old and he had his friends. They were all 16, 17. And we went to Black River Falls in Wisconsin and we joined one of the traditional lacrosse tournaments they had over there. And it was, we got beat up good in there, but it was fun. It was, it was, I never experienced anything like it before. Um, and then the hoop and arrow and archery, you know, there are traditional archery are things that I'm really big into also for teaching young men because they kind of have that representation of being, you know, a warrior and um, the, the skill that it takes to be able to utilize those things. So those are also some of my favorites. Well, I tell you what, I think that what I'd really like to try out is that, now correct me if I say this wrong, wrong. Kansu? Kansu, yeah. Kansu. I would like to try that because it seems like I wouldn't beat up my own body. And at this, <laughs> at this stage of my life, I want to take it easy, but I'd love to learn that. That's the one I think I'd like to learn. I'd like to learn. Yeah, yeah. So do we have any other questions from the, uh, from the audience? Okay. Oh, 
Is there another one? Nope. All right. So Jeremy, I just want to thank you so much and, and uh, just remind everybody that we got how many videos? I think six videos, five or six videos or six. of yeah. of native activities on our website. Check it out at neutrinoday.com. Um, and then check out some of the other activities we have as well. Um, and then I just want to remind you of some activities we have coming up today, um, or I'm sorry, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we have um, Sanford Lab's own experiment support scientist, Mark Hanhart, who is going to be joining science comedian Brian Mallow to discuss the Big Bang and its role in the formation of the universe. Now, I want to just make this clear about Brian. He, we, we bill him as a science comedian, but he's also really a good science communicator. And so he's done, he's been interviewing scientists for years. Now, also tomorrow we'll be joined uh, by Peggy Norris with our education and outreach team. Peggy's activity tomorrow will float, focus on the formation of gold in the Black Hills. And I'll, I'll just t let you in on a not so secret thing. It's all kind of related to the Big Bang and what happened in the, in the universe. And um, finally, tomorrow night at six o'clock, we have multimedia artist Gina Gibson uh, here to discuss her experience as Surf's first artist in residence. And talk a little bit about what her experience was like here at Surf. And Jeremy, uh, we all know that, um, or we talk about this a lot at Sanford Lab. So tomorrow we're gonna to be talking about the Big Bang, but that's also something that Native Americans uh, um, talk about as well, is that they come from the stars, that you know, we're, we're all part of that, that uh, the stars that, that uh, we see every day. Science talks about it a lot, but that's part of the culture that you come from it too, is, is that right? right? Or is that not your realm yeah. of, of uh, discussion? <laughs> No, that's no, that that's really interesting, you know, because it is, and I think that as uh, Dakota people, we're we're realizing that that a lot of things that science and people today are starting to understand and realize that our people have known about some of that stuff for a long time. Yeah, and that's and we uh, we actually have talked with uh, Jace Decorey, who is with the Black Hill State University, and she. Uh, does a wonderful presentation on that and, sure. and uh, likes to talk about those strong connections to science and, and the native ways of knowing. So Jeremy, yeah. thank you again for joining us today. So good to have you. Looking forward to participating in some of your activities this week. Yes, Don't forget you. folks, Neutrino Day, www.neutrinoday.com. See you uh, on the internet.